be one. Um, yep, thanks for that, Dan. Um, I'm just going to give it a, another minute um, before I get going, just to make sure everyone who wants to join has had the opportunity to. Uh, but thank you very much for joining me um, in my last um, training session, this masterclass. Uh, lucky last, let's hope. Uh, and I'm quite excited about the topic I'll be talking to you uh, about today. Um, if you can remember back to when we talked about Tholian maps, um, again, I was quite excited for people in that uh, with very little code, you can create something visual on screen. Uh, and we'll be going from zero to, um, you know, uh, a nice little app, um, web-based, that is going to allow you to... Um, upload a CSV, make a modification to it and download it again. Uh, but we'll also touch on other use cases uh, as we go through, uh, including making maps uh, that you can deploy to a, a, a server. Uh, so, you know, very much, uh, you know, uh, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Uh, it'll be nice uh, point and click, which makes a nice user interface for the end user. Um, the code, however, um, well, I'll let you decide for yourself. Um, and as you know, um, my colleague Tom will also be talking to you about an alternative to Shiny for Python uh, in that streamlet. Um, they're both different. I'm not saying which is better, which is worse. Uh, but you know, you may come to your own conclusions after you've been to both masterclasses. But anyway, um, I think I'll get going if that's all right with everyone. Uh, and so today, I'm going to be talking to you about a few things, and I should apologize in advance. This is the first time I've ever um, delivered this training, uh, or, you know, uh, I've only really learned about uh, Shiny for Python very, very recently. Uh, I'll explain why in a moment. Um, so we've allotted 90 minutes, not sure how that's going to work out. Um, it may be a case that the exercise I have for you all to try, uh, you might have to do in your own time. Obviously, I'll be around for people to ask questions um, or, um, yeah, the solutions to which will be available uh, later today anyway. Uh, so you won't be any the worse if you have to duck out. Um, so as I say, we'll be talking about what is Shiny for Python and why would you use it? making sure everyone understands what an interactive app or dashboard is. Um, I'm gonna show you some examples of deployed Shiny apps that have been uh, that are available on the web. Then I'll be talking to you about the anatomy of a Shiny app, but what, what code kind of goes into making it. Um, very quickly, we'll just talk about installing an add-on for VS Code, which allows you to see the web browser within the application instead of having to launch a separate one. Um, uh, we'll be talking very broadly about the principles of how it works. Um, next, we'll get our pasting tables out and we'll do some decorating. Uh, not quite, but I'll be talking to you uh, about something called decorators. Um, and these are fundamentals of Python programming. Uh, weren't covered in module one, uh, but a good opportunity to talk about them now because they are used um, when you're you worrying about your outputs uh, for Shiny. Uh, I'll give you some high level differences with Streamlet. Uh, again, I'm not here to say one's better or worse. Um, I wouldn't dare uh, in front of Tom. Um, but you know, you guys will have to decide for yourself. Uh, and then finally, we'll be walking through some examples. So you actually get a chance to see how uh, to make the magic happen. Uh, and as I say, there's one exercise for you all to try. Uh, not it, it's relatively complex. Um, but luckily, the amount of code that you have to add to it is minimal, uh, and it's just more to give you a theoretical understanding. So without any more ado, let's get on. So what is Shiny for Python? Um, I asked if anyone had used Shiny for R uh, in the channel. I, from memory, I only saw one response. Um, but basically, it is a framework that allows you to create interactive apps and dashboards in an easy-ish manner. Uh, and that ish was even added by a uh, gentleman, Joe Cheng, who is the CTO of uh, our studio, now known as Posit. So I think even he admits that um, as you get more complex, uh, so does the code. Uh, so it's relatively easy. But as I say, the more you want to do, uh, the, the more in depth it gets, which which is fine. There's amazing documentation for it. Uh, so we're very lucky to have access to that. So what is Shiny for Python and why would we use it? Well, Shiny um, for R was originally released in, I believe, November 2012. Um, so we're coming up, uh, you know, 11 years old. Um, whereas Shiny for Python, the, this framework, was only released last year. Uh, and at the time, obviously, it, it was in alpha. So it's still very, very new. There are lots of similarities. And there's documentation to help people who know R Shiny to migrate to PyShiny. Um, but the great thing about it 
uh, is that it gives you a framework to create, as I say, interactive apps and dashboards with Python code. And the amazing thing is there's no need to know HTML or CSS styling sheets or JavaScript. However, if you do know them, that is great because it will allow you to enhance your app even further, but there's definitely no, no requirements. And there's so many examples on their documentation uh, that you'll probably be able to find what you need and you know, uh, copy and paste to make something similar that's gonna work for your use case. Another benefit is that this framework is compatible with um, all the usual data science packages, so Pandas, NumPy, uh, Scikit-Learn, and it also integrates with Matplotlib, Seaborn, um, Plotly, etc. Uh, so that's great that you can have visualizations as well, and you'll see those uh, in the later slides. Um, if anyone's got the PDF slides and they do know our Shiny, you can follow that link there, and that will take you to the, the similarities to help you migrate across and ramp up your learning of the Pi Shiny. So just to make sure everyone understands what an interactive app or dashboard is, basically we have a web browser, so all the popular ones there, uh, and then you have a server uh, which you've got Python running on it. And when you perform an action in the web browser, that's known as an input, and that can comprise of things like kick clicks or key presses or something like that, moving a slider, and that is fed into the server, the server then does something, and then it spits out an output. And that output could be a plot, so a graph, a tables, it could change a visualization or something on the screen, so text or whatever it happens to be. And it may perform other functions too, as you'll see um, with the exercise I'm gonna get you all to complete later, uh, in that you know, perform modifications to data frames and spit it out. But just imagine if you've created something and it sources data from multiple different data sources, uh, throws it together, cleans it, grooms it, makes it look all pretty, and then spits out the CSV. If you could make a nice web app uh, and the user can just change some parameters, so dates or sites or hospitals, click run, and then it'll spit out a CSV for them then you know imagine the power of that rather than saying oh here's 12 uh, python scripts for you to run they're not going to know the first thing what to do uh, and this is all taken care of behind the scenes for them so as i say we've got two different examples here um of um deployed apps so respiratory disease data and then simulating a t-test so i'll just launch chrome and so here's the respiratory disease app oh so i'll just hit refresh on this and can everyone see the screen? Sorry, I just saw something from Slack pop up. But essentially, um, so I'm just going to open the chat window just in case I'm missing something here. Cool. I think you um, your message, Elliot. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, so as you can see, this is a shiny app. And um, we've got two different panes. We've got uh, a pane or panel down the left-hand side, which has got some static text that tells us about what the app is. And um, we can use this slider to change the year of the data. Um, and then we've got some other information here. Ooh, and you can see on the right, uh, similar to Folium, we've got a map. And you know, changing the slider changes the data that renders the map. Um, and then you can zoom in and zoom out. And uh, if you click on certain points, then you get pop-ups. So again, very, very similar to what we saw with Folium uh, with different information. So again, nice and powerful, uh, very visual, makes it easy for people to understand. Uh, and then with this one, we've got lots of different inputs. Uh, and so this is for um, t-test sample distribution. So let's say we wanted to have uh, 10,000, and we can change the standard deviation and the mean. And then we could say, well, if we wanted the distribution to, to have 20,000, um, how would that look? And so you can compare and contrast uh, by playing with the different numbers. You can change the, the range. And you'll notice after we've completed the modification, whether that be updating the number in a cell, um, on the left or changing the slider, it then re-renders based on that new information. So a new set of inputs are going in, it then runs it and then spits it out. Uh, and it also changes um, the, the text that appears on the right-hand side as well. So hopefully this starts to give you some ideas of where you can go uh, with, with this. So next, um, I wanted to talk about, well, what is the anatomy of a Shiny app? Um, there's a lot of commonality, no matter how complex you get, uh, it all kind of starts here. 
And so hopefully, uh, you know, it may have been a good few weeks, if not months, since uh, some of you have looked at Python code, uh, but it's not looking too scary here. We've just, uh, as we would usually see at the start of any uh, .py file, we've got our imports. Uh, and so in this one, uh, from the uh, Shiny library, we're going to import app, which is very important, render and the UI. And then we've just got standard libraries, so NumPy and Matplotlib. Um, and the first thing we do, um, we create this variable app UI, and this is creating the user interface. And essentially, this is going to generate HTML uh, using this code to send to the browser. So you don't need to know the HTML. Uh, what you have here is we're going to have um, a page of fixed width. We are then inside of that, we are then going to have an input slider. Uh, and then we're also going to have the uh, a, an output plot. So as a result of that slider, again, we'll get more into the technical shortly, but just a high level idea. Next, we've got the server logic, and that's always in a function that we define called server. And you'll always see the same um, variables uh, or parameters for it, input, output, and session. Next, you'll see um, we've got two what are called decorators. So these things with uh, an at in front of them, and they modify the output of the code, but don't worry too much about that at the moment. And then we've got uh, another function, which is plot, and that basically is going to take in the value from the slider, uh, do some modification to it, and then return uh, a matplotlib histogram. Then finally, we need to marry these two things together. So the user interface and the server, so app UI and the server function to create uh, a variable called app. Uh, and the certain things that you know must be uh, a certain way. So the, the, the file must always be called app.py, as we'll see later, uh, but also these parameter names must always be the same as well. And that's just how it generates. Um, so, one thing to say, um, today's session, I should have said this earlier, uh, you can follow along in VS Code, um, but also doesn't matter if you haven't got VS Code or you haven't got it set up, there is also um, a web browsing version. So I shall just put the link to that in the chat window. So anyone who wants to have a play along, um, even though this is the examples for uh, Shiny for Python, the great thing is if we modify any code in here at all, uh, let's just say, uh, hello, Elliot, I can modify this code in any way, shape or form I want. I then hit this play button up here, and then that will run the code. So you can actually make all the changes you want. So kind of similar to bind it in a way. Obviously, if you hit refresh, um, you'll lose it. Uh, so there's no, um, you can't, you know, I'm trying to remember how you say it. Oh, yeah, you can export it. Um, but just be mindful. So when I was learning, I did a lot of copying and pasting into a notepad file just to make sure I didn't lose anything. Alternatively, you've got VS Code. And again, I'm just going to load uh, something here. Um, and with VS Code, um, once you've installed the plugin, which I'm about to show you, you can see we've got our imports um, and then we've just got the user interface and we haven't actually defined anything within our server logic. When we hit play, we then get the, the uh, user interface, which uh, is dictated by the code on the left. So hopefully that will make sense. Um, as I said, for anyone who has got VS Code working and whose overzealous IT departments have not decided to IP block the uh, Anaconda uh, or any other repositories, um, you just need to go into the extensions uh, tab on the left and search for Shiny, and you're looking for the first um, option, which is Shiny for Python from Posit, uh, who are formerly our studio that decided to change the name. So again, you'll have a chance to do that later on. Um, but as I say, if you need to, you can follow along in the web browser. Um, everything works exactly the same for both. Uh, the one thing I will say, the exercise we're doing, um, works best if you use the web version um, or if you got the IP address and put it into your web browser instead of using the built-in one I've just shown you in VS Code and that's purely for the download of the iPlus file. Uh, as I mentioned earlier it's just really important that you always call your um, app that you're going to create for Shiny uh, app.py for when you run that. So let's talk about the principles of how Shiny for Python works. 
Um, so let's imagine you've got some code here, nothing to do with visualization, uh, but you wanted to set some parameters, which are going to be your file name, uh, columns of interest, um, uh, color scheme for a map, and the number of rows. Then we load data. So um, we're just going to use our pandas read CSV. They're going to create a variable data frame. So again, this should all look very familiar. Um, we're then going to manipulate that data frame. We're going to pull out two columns, the uh, ones, the X column, Y column, so region ID and measurements. We're then going to preview. We're going to show the first five rows using their dot head function. And then finally, we're going to plot those two columns, X against Y, using the color map as defined here. Sorry, we're, uh, we're using seven rows for the uh, preview. So we have our, imagine these, it to start to translate it in shiny language. We've got our inputs, we've got our outputs, be the preview, and then we've also got the plot itself. And so when the inputs change, that's gonna have a downstream effect and change the output as well. And then we have our intermediate values. So if something changes here, we then have to redefine, you know, if we change the file name, obviously that would then uh, change the uh, data frame object. Uh, and then if we change the column names, that also has to flow, th flow through as well. So let's think about it. We've got these different parameters and these parameters touch different parts of the downstream um, variables. And you can just see some terrible, um, lines there but just gives you an idea not every parameter it touches every cell below with the different commands in so let's think of another way that we could display this information um now we are going to put our parameters at the top of the page so we've got our data set x call y call so on and so forth uh, and then we're going to step through like as was if we're stepping down the different processes that we need to do so first of all we'll load the data We'll then create a second data frame with limited columns, create a preview, and then finally plot it. And again, instead of those um, arrows that were all bunched up to the right of the cells before, uh, this makes it slightly easier to see where one variable changes another. Um, and the reason that is important, because this is one of the slight differences with Shiny, if something changes in, sorry, in Streamlit compared to Shiny, uh, if one variable changes, it tends to refresh absolutely everything, whereas Shiny will just change whatever is touched by that particular variable. So it's possibly less computationally expensive, uh, depending on, on what you're doing. And so what we can see here, uh, we've now started to add our decorators. Uh, so we know that this, uh, when we're loading the data, that's a reactive calc. So depending on the, um, the name of the data set, if that changes, then we need to uh, readjust that, recreate that data frame object. Um, again, creating that sub data frame with the selected columns. Then we want to use a decorator output and a second one, render table. So again, these decorators are basically adding um, additional information to that um, data frame head command uh, so that it will render nicely in HTML. So it'll appear as an output and it'll appear in a tabular format uh, rather than just um, spaced numbers. And then finally, we have got an, another output. And again, this one is with a second decorator known as render plot. So again, this will put an actual graph onto the screen. So with Shani, uh, you just need to maintain these different chunks of code and not actually the relationships between them. Uh, you divide the chunks, you um, you know, you divide the code into chunks that really make sense. And then you provide decorators above each chunk just to explain what that chunk of or that block of code is doing. So as we mentioned before, we have our intermediate values. And the purpose of these two blocks is just to generate values that are used elsewhere, i.e. the outputs. Uh, and then for these two outputs, uh, we need to say what kind of output they're going to be. One of them will be a table, and the other one is going to be a plot. And all of this is in the documentation, but we'll see examples as we go along. So let's actually have a go at putting this into a shiny format. Um, again, we're going to step through this. Um, if anyone uh, thinks I'm going too fast or anything like that, please just shout out. And um, the great thing is that obviously you'll have the notes and this recording to refer back to. So as I say, we've got our four lines of code here, each doing uh, distinct and different things. And then we're going to break these into chunks of code. So the first thing we're going to do 
is create a function for each and every step. Uh, so handily, uh, we've called the first one uh, the function df, and that is simply going to return the same as the pandas read CSV. And here we're saying the, we have an input value uh, and whatever the data set name is. Uh, just to go back a step, um, you'll remember that we're saying uh, da, 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 um, the variable or parameter names are data set x call, y call, cmap, and number of rows. Um, and then we've got our second um, manipulated data frame, which is just using the two X and Y column. Then we are going to return um, for the preview, the head of the, the um, preview and with the number of rows. And then finally, we're going to return the plot, um, which takes in the column names and then the column map as well. We're then going to add respective decorators to each of these functions we've defined. So we discussed this a few slides ago, talking about our reactive calcs, and then our two outputs, one for a render table and one for a render plot. Um, and then if df and df2 have values that have changed in the functions, um, uh, um, basically, when these are rerun, it will kind of import, you know, when we run this, if the value that has um, created this has changed, it will come up with the most up-to-date up values. Um, and interestingly, um, again, we'll talk about this more um, when we look at decorators, um, just at a, a higher level. Uh, what we're doing here, instead of returning, or sorry, instead of calling, um, you know, a variable, with the read CSV saved into it, we're actually pulling in the whole function because that function is going to return the read CSV. Uh, and then similarly here, this is going to return the two columns. And then this is going to use those two columns to create the plot. So it's a slightly different way of thinking about things, but don't worry too much as this is confusing. Um, I've got a Jupyter notebook file that we'll work through, which hopefully should explain it in a lot more detail. And again, you'll be able to refer back to it. So we add our respective decorators here. And then we finally put all of these functions with their decorators inside the server function, which you'll remember from the basic anatomy. Again, that's going to have the parameters input, output, and session. So um, if everyone's all right, if we can just take um, a couple of minutes, just till 25 past, uh, so just three minutes. And then we will work through the um, decorators Jupyter notebook file. So if you've downloaded the repository in the code along, it's um, the first file in the 01 decorators. Uh, again, you can use that in Jupyter notebook or you can use it in VS code um, if you've got that installed. All right, so I will see you all in three minutes. That should give everyone enough time to launch uh, Jupyter notebook. Uh, and then we'll just walk through this exercise. It's slightly different. Um, so hopefully, uh, if you're a little bit confused, this should start to put things into perspective for you. All right, see you in a few minutes. Great, so hopefully everyone has been able to load the Jupyter notebook file. Um, as I mentioned, I'll be looking at it in VS Code today. Um, and so you'll notice the contrast is a little bit different. Um, so instead of the black on white, it's now inverse. Um, but as I say, this is a standalone exercise. So if you want to repeat it, um, all the comments are there. So, you know, even if you're watching this uh, online later, uh, you can just have a go at this in your own time and it should all be self-explanatory. But basically, um, for those who aren't familiar, uh, decorators um, are functions that modify the uh, or change the behavior um of sorry decorators are things that change or modify the behavior of another function um directly within the code um and it's not just specific to shiny uh, these can be used in lots of different places in python um and so just to explain this a little bit better we're going to take a step back uh, and just remind ourselves of some of the fundamental aspects of, of python um in that functions can be represented as objects so we're going to go right back to, you know, uh, week one here. So we're going to create a new function in this instance called F1. And this function is simply going to print the string called F1. 
So if I run that by pressing shift and return on my keyboard, we can see we have our output uh, called F1. So that's exactly what we'll do. That's what we want. So next we wanna see what happens. What happens if we print just the F1, the function name, but don't put the parentheses afterwards? Um, how many people in the chat think it's gonna display the text called F1? Good, it's not. What it's gonna return uh, is just some output uh, and a memory address telling us that it's something, it's a function, and the function name is F1. So it's it's an object. Uh, it only returns a value when you add the parentheses. So just to exemplify that. So when I do print F1 and add the parentheses, uh, you can now see it actually calls the function itself. So next, um, we know that F1 is an object. Um, and so let's see what happens if we create a new function uh, that takes in as an input parameter um, a, a value f of x. So we've got function one, f1, and that's still going to be the print statement. Next, we're going to create this new function, f2, and that takes in an argument. Um, and that basically is going to call the argument. So you can see here, it's going to, whatever arguments or um, function or variable we pass in, it's going to add the parentheses to it and run that. So how many people think when I run this cell, we're going to get called F1? OK, so hopefully people are listening. <laughs> um, as you can see, what's happened when we're calling F2, we've passed in the variable, uh, the object F1, and that object has then been called because we're doing that inside the F2 function. So. Let's, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything out because I don't want to cause any more confusion. Um, basically, um, what we're going to do now is create something called a wrapper. Um, and this is going to modify the function. So we're going to create a new function called G1, and that's going to take as an input variable, uh, a variable named func, which obviously could be a function. We'll then create another function within that the name wrapper. And what's going to happen when wrapper is executed, it's going to do a print statement with started. It's then going to call the function or the variable we've passed in. And then it's going to print another uh, string, which is ended. And then finally, um, when we uh, execute or when we call this G1 function, we want it to return the wrapper subfunction. So if we load that into the memory, so that's done. And so let's say we create a brand new function called G. And the purpose of this function is just to print the string hello. Execute that. Let's see what happens when we call this G1 function, passing in the new function G, which is just the hello print statement. We can see um, we just get the function name. So not exactly what we would expect. So what we want to do is actually you know, because all that's done is return wrapper. So it's returned the object, but it hasn't called it. So if we add the parentheses afterwards, it's essentially then going to give us um, wrapper open close parentheses. And so you can see this time when we're running this, we get the started, hello, and then ended. And then if we just want to have a look at this again. So again, similar to before, if we just do a print statement on the G1 of G, um, you can just see it's returning a function, G1, uh, and then it's got a sub-function called wrapper and the memory address for that. So next, um, if we wanted to put this function into a variable called H, we can. So we've now got um, a, a new object. So if we run this cell, we can see we've created this new object, which is essentially uh, G1 of G. And then we're calling it by adding the parentheses at the end, and then that's actually executing it. And again, this will be different to just if we just typed in H and executed that. Again, we're just seeing that it's a function G1 uh, and then the wrapper subfunction. So again, to kind of put this all together and just to demonstrate we can use any variable name that we want, we're creating this new function K1. We've then got the wrapper with the started executing the input variable function and ended. 
It's going to return the wrapper. We're then going to create a brand new function, k, with just the hello statement. And then we're going to call k1, feeding in the k function, and then execute that by calling it with the parentheses. And you can see we've got the hello, sorry, the started hello and ended. So this is what it looked like before. So if we just took k as a function in isolation, we've just got hello. But then when we then add it as a decorator, so adding the at and then the k1, which is what we have here, we can now see uh, we've created a, a new function called m. Uh, to find that, it's just going to be the hello print statement. If we run that, and if we call m, even though m on its own is just the hello print statement, because we've added this decorator immediately before it, it's then going to use the functions um, of, it's going to inherit those functions or make the modification. So you can see now it's pulling in the functionality of K1 as well as the function M. So hopefully um, people are able to, to follow along with that. As I say, um, if you are slightly confused at all, it's great to go through this uh, alone later. As I say, it's meant to be standalone. Elliot, sorry, um, can, can I just, right? because I'm, I'm conscious it's, um, a bit weird to get your head around decorators um so i'm just I, i'm just it might be worth just seeing if there's a show of hands if anybody needs to sort of go over that uh a little bit again i'm just conscious that's quite a bit to take in uh <laughs> sure cool so if shall we go to maybe if we go to the top and then we'll just um take it from there yeah, I, just, I mean, just, you could set through more quickly. I'm just conscious that that um, yeah, just to just to sort of fully explain that um, that 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 kind of process a little bit more. I think uh, once you start to talking about the uh, uh, where are we? Um, so I think hopefully everyone's got the uh, uh, you know the, the idea that you that, you know a function is um, an object um, and that you need the parentheses to to call that function to to run it. Um, so perhaps from that point, I think maybe where you, you might lose people. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so with the, with the round about here. So yeah. sorry, was this? I, I I might be wrong. Maybe everybody's uh, understood. Yeah. I just, I'm just very conscious that it takes a little bit of getting your head around this. So <laughs> sure. So as I say, um, you know we we've. Um, I'll just need to run all these cells above. Sorry. Um, just so if I start to run something else, it will make sense. Um, so just again to remember that functions are objects, and if you don't add the parentheses, it won't call the object. It won't actually run it, uh, but it's then stored in the memory uh, for something that you can later call. Um, and I think if we go down to here, so. The great thing is because these functions are objects, we can save the function or we can save that object into a variable with any name at all. Um, and so as we've got the example here, we're creating a brand new variable h, and that variable is as the function g1 um, being called, and it's passing in the parameter of g, another function, which has the which just simply has a print statement of hello. Then if we didn't call if i'm just going to comment this out if i run this cell now you can see we don't see anything at all if i just ask python what is h well it will tell me the variable h is a function um within it it's got another function g1 and then it's got a wrapper so if i then create a new cell and then put in h and call it and by call it i mean i'm adding the open close parentheses to identify that it's a function now it's essentially doing the two different functions, the G1, which then gives us the started and the end, and then the G, which is the hello. And you can see it prints all three lines. So essentially, it has now been able to modify the behavior. Uh, and we've been able to give that any name we wanted, even though the functions are G1 and G. I could call it Bob, Cyril, um, variable one, whatever it happens to be. We can give it any name. Uh, and then when we call that new variable name, it will execute those other two functions. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. Uh, and so just to show that we can use any function name we want, we're creating a brand new function k1 with the parameter func. So assuming it's going to receive a function. 
then it's going to have a sub function named wrapper, which doesn't take in any input for our um, parameter, doesn't need to. It's going to have two print statements, a started and an ended. Um, but it is also in the middle going to call whatever parameter is passed in. So the function is going to call it with the open close parameters. And then when this K1 function is run, it's going to return the wrapper. So it's essentially going to go call this. It's going to go down here. It's going to go right, return the wrapper. So it will turn this wrapper object, but it's not going to call it. It's just going to pass out a packaged, us, packaged up function object. And then if we've got this K function, uh, which again, just the hello statement, we're creating a brand new object called X, um, which is calling K1 and then passing in the parameter or the variable K, which is another function. And again, if I comment this out, if I execute this cell, it's just telling us X is a function and it hasn't called it. But if I run it again, removing the, uh, the comment out, so X with the open close parentheses, it then calls both of the functions within, so K1 and then K. So hopefully everyone is with me. It's not as clear as mud. So on its own, K would just give us the uh, print statement, hello. Then this K1, which we defined up here, and it can be a decorator because it has a subfunction called wrapper. If we then use it as a decorator, so put the at and the name of the function, that's basically saying anything immediately below it is then going to be um, packaged up with that wrapper. And so we've now got K1, and then we've got a new function M, which is just a print statement. So when we call that, execute it, and then call it, you can see it's done the two sub functions within it. But similarly, if we commented out the call function, it's just going to tell us it's an object. So hopefully you can see that by adding that decorator, uh, which that decorator in this case is just two strings started and ended, and then we put the sub function in the middle, that could be much more elaborate. That could be HTML, um, it could be anything really, anything you wanted. And so that means that if you've got, you know, you can use it consistently. So you, it then becomes repeatable time and time again, without having to type out the same load of big code, you just add it as a decorator. Is that a little bit better? Silence is golden. There's nothing coming up in the chat, so I'm, I'm assuming people understand. <laughs> cool. All right. So one thing we haven't touched on now um, is helping us to um, develop our understanding of decorators by using the args and the keyword arguments um, uh, variables, um, if you like. Um, and so you may have seen these referenced, I think, in module one or when you've been doing your own research. Um, and so great thing about these, we can then start to add in um, uh, a number of, of different parameters that can get passed in at the same time. Uh, you'll see what I mean now. So if we've got this decorator K1, which we defined above, uh, and that's going to be the wrapper or um, or the, um, the decorator for function n, which is going to take in a variable called a. And then what that's going to do is print that variable a. What you can see here now is when we call n, which we're defining here, and pass in the variable, a string of high, when we execute that, we're going to have started. Um, oh, we're going to get an error, which is meant to happen um, because um, we haven't told um, this, sorry, the um, the decorator wasn't expecting to see any other parameter passed in, you know, because before we were just not passing in parameters. Uh, and so it throws out an error. It says wrapper, which you'll remember is the sub function, um, takes in zero positional arguments, yet one was given. And so we've confused it. So what we can do now is make a modification to our K1 um decorator and we've still got we're going to define the wrapper function within but now we are going to add asterisk args and double asterisk keyword arguments or kw args uh, we will then have our same print statements above and below and then we are going to call that function with the args and keyword args 
So now we've done that. If we run it again, so this is the same as we had before, we've got the wrapper K1, and we're going to create a new function N passing in a variable A. When we run this now, because we've told it to expect um, variables, and there can be an infant number, as you'll see, it will then work as expected. So now all of a sudden, the wrapper function is expecting at least one variable. So we can see here, we passed in the string of high, and then that spat out again with the preceding um, and uh, following started and ended strings. Uh, and then let's say if we wanted to um, allow a parameter to be added in and then set a default for a second parameter, we've got parameter A, which we'll be expecting, and parameter B, which is going to be default of now, which if we uh, wanted, we could pass in a different one on a different occasion. If we hit return on this, we can now see it's we've got our um, started and ended strings, but this time we can see print A and B, and we can see A is going to be high, which is this string here, and nine because that was set as a default when we created the parameter, the function, then that has printed out by um, default. If I then put B equals world. Hit return on that you can now see that it's because we are updating the default parameter um from nine to the string of world it's going to say world again if we wanted more we could do so and um, we could have two static uh, two um variable parameters a and b and then we can set c as a default again of nine so when we hit return here it's then going to say hi which is the first string Bob, which is a second, and then because C is set as a default of nine, it will spit that out as well. Um, but I could then add C, C equals, how are you? When I run that, you can see because we want to override the default value of nine, that's added the string, how are you, to the preceding two. So again, hopefully that starts to make a bit of sense. And so they, in the purpose of shiny um obviously we're just saying for example output you know the first seven rows of a table but obviously that's not an html so by adding these decorators at the start of the functions that are going to return those seven rows of the table it adds the other code that's required for the browser to render it so it looks nice when we look at it on screen hopefully when you we get into some more of the examples this will start to make a little bit more sense Cool. As I say, that is standalone. So, you know, feel free to go through it again in your own time. Hopefully the explanations uh, when read uh, quietly and slowly uh, could make a little bit more sense than I do right now. So next we will look at our very first Shiny app. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the applications consist of two parts. We have our user interface, um, which is that app UI variable we create here. And then we've got our server function below. We are then combining them together um, using this shiny.app, using the UI and the server to create a variable with server. Um, and the done out parts of the app, they what will happen inside the server. In this instance, we are not going to give it anything. So it's going to be pretty static. It's just going to give us the user interface. So you can try this for yourselves um, inside the code along folder. There's a second folder called O2 My First Shiny App, app.py. So if you want to use the web browser, simply open the .py file. You can even do it in Notepad, and you can copy and paste it into that uh, URL I put before. Then use the little play button, and it will execute it. Um, otherwise, you can use it in VS Code, but I will just copy this link into the chat window again in case anyone's lost it or closed it. Again, just override the code. I'll show you here. So if I go into 0, 2, app.py, which I'm going to copy that, go in here, control A to um, select all the text, control V, hit the play symbol, and you can see the output on the right. And if we do it in VS Code, We can see we've got our simple web browser opens here and it's outputted to the screen here. So, uh, Ellie, sorry, um, uh, I've just tried to run it in VS. I mean, it might be me, so don't spend time debugging me, but 
I've just tried to run it in VS Code and nothing happens. Oh, okay. that's because I'm wrong environment. So, so no, things wrong. to make sure. First of all, um, that you've got the correct Python interpreter uh, running. So to do that, you can check that on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. So if you're using an environment that has Shiny installed in it, if you click yeah, on the bottom it's, right. I forgot to change the environment, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. No, it's, it's these are the types of problems that people have. Uh, yeah. The other thing to make sure is that you've installed the extension. Remember, extension on the left-hand side, look for Shiny, and then it's the first option from Posit. Make sure that's installed. And the other troubleshooting thing that I came across, the file must be called app.py. Can't be app underscore, app space. It must be app.py. Anything else won't work. And if you're still having problems, the first time you run it um, on the play symbol, to the right of that, if you do run Shiny app, if you click that the first time, that should open the web browser. Mine's now working, thank you. <laughs> Excellent, that's what we like to hear. There's always one. Um, so let's just see. Um, as you can see, a very, very basic app, not terribly useful because there's no user interface, um, but um, we can uh, you know we can modify this string here uh just put some lips and text in here run it again and you can see it re-renders oh uh, the other thing i should mention if you're using vs code uh control s to save file so you save the app.py and then run it and that's when um you will get the updated text here so if just to make sure, um, have you got the Shiny Python, um, the environment that I put up the link to the other day, or have you installed Shiny in whichever environments that you're running uh, VS Code in? So if you haven't installed Shiny, so pip install Shiny, or the environment I gave you that has Shiny and all the other modules we need for today, that could be a problem. Cool. Um, if anyone can't see the interpreter at the bottom right, the other way to get it up on VS Code is press Control, Shift, and P Oop, simultaneously. And um, you can search for, the great thing is you just start typing, and it's Python space select interpreter, which is the first option here. And that gives us the drop down as well. So here we can see all of the different um, environments that I've got installed. It's worth flagging up, Elliot, as well, because I'm uh, so this is the problem I, I ran into. Um, uh, and I, I'm new to VS Code too, so I'm, I'm, I'm learning it. Um, it sometimes it sometimes it seems a bit inconsistent in in what it does with the environment. So uh, when I opened, for example, the Jupyter Notebook earlier, it said, OK, which environment do you want? So I selected the Shiny environment. I then opened the .py file and it had quietly then switched to uh, my BERT environment, uh, for example, that I've been using for .py files. So that might catch people out, particularly if you're, and I, I've been caught up with this before, particularly if you're switching between Jupyter Notebooks and .py files, um, it seems that VS Code will remember the uh, the last, well, sometimes it'll remember the last entry uh, for whatever environment you want to use for a .py file. And that may be different to what it is in a Jupyter Notebook. But it also will flip back as well and, and not tell you. <laughs> so. Excellent point. So, yeah, you know, as Dan said, always double check your environment. Hopefully, yeah. it should always be visible the bottom right hand side of the screen. So, even though you've set it before you open the file, once you've opened it, it may jump over to something else. Uh, just double check that. So, either click in the bottom right or Control Shift P, select interpreter, uh, just to make sure that is set correctly. Because otherwise, you may get, you know, module not installed or another problem. Um, one thing I'll just point out quickly, um, you can see in the um, simple browser here, as well as I've just um, increased the size of the terminal at the bottom of the um, screen here, we can see we've got a URL. So 127.000.1 is your local machine. Uh, and then it's on port 44378. If I launch Chrome and then paste in that value, No, uh, ignore me. Um, <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. Knew that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I think it's because it's using these because we've got this shiny extension um, installed. But usually, if we didn't, if we just ran it, um, if I just do run Python file. Uh, I'll have to get back to you, but um, there, there will be a, um, a URL. Um, 
actually? Is it because I missed off the preceding HTTP? Let's have a look. Yep, there you go. Uh, if you put the HTTP slash colon slash slash in front of it, you then get the app as it was running. If you wanted to see what it would look like in a web browser, you know, full width, the complete size of your desktop rather than the simple browser within VS Code. All the joys of learning new software. Um, just also remember, you know, I've selected it here. Don't press Control C when this terminal is selected because that will kill it. Um, so you need to select it with your mouse, then right click and copy. Uh, because if I press Control C, it will end that session. And so when you go into um, um, the web browser, it won't run because you've killed the actual uh, Shiny server app. Cool. So the next um, evolution uh, of this is to, um, instead of just simply printing the uh, string to the screen, we are then going to add a um, slider. And again, this isn't going to do anything, uh, but it will be interactive so we can move it. So again, I've got another file for us, 03, but just quickly to point out um, on this screen where it's a little bit bigger, we are going to add this input slider function. And again, this um, comes from the UI library within Shiny. Uh, and again, the documentation clearly explains what all of the in and outputs uh, available to you are. Um, so we can see um, we've got our UI.page fluid. Now, I would say for every use case that you're going to be using, page fluid is going to be suitable for you. And, um, you know, the, it gets more complex as we go on. Uh, but from what I've seen, it's going to cover 99% of use cases unless you're doing something mega complex, uh, which could be out of the, the realms of HSMA. So within this page fluid, we're going to have two things. The first one being our uh, input slider. Uh, and that is going to take in a variable or uh, it's going to save the value that the slider is set to as a variable called n. Um, we've then got some a string which choose a number n and that is the string that appears above the slider itself. We can then see we want the slider to be available for values of zero on the left to 100 on the right. And by default, when it first renders, we want the slider to be set to a value of 40. Then we all, we've also told it to put some output text verbatim, which basically means it's unformatted. It's just going to put it out in like a, um, a courier font or free mono if you use Linux. Um, but as you can see, because we've not told it, it doesn't know where to get that from. And um, we don't need to worry about that yet. So we, even though it's written there, don't expect to see anything. So if I just go back into VS Code and go into the file terminal, and we'll go to number three. Shut these down. So we get exactly what we saw on the last screen. Um, if I hit play on that, we can now all of a sudden see uh, we've got our slider value. So I can change that along, go drag and drop it. Obviously, it's not doing anything with it. It will just simply save wherever you release the mouse button. Uh, but let's say I wanted to change that 0 to 50, and I wanted the value to be 25. If I control S to save that, it will then notice I've changed some of the values in it and it'll rerun it. And you can see now the slider runs from zero to 50 with a default value of 25. So again, you can start to see they're giving the framework to quite easily to create, uh, create uh, something that can then be used to modify something downstream. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Um, as I say, the input slider is the functionality we have here. And I've already explained how all of these different variables make sense. Now, this is just one of the things you've got to learn when you're getting to grips with, um, with Shiny. But it's all it's all quite consistent. Um, so, you know, it's very, very quick and easy to, to pick up. And as I said, yeah, we're not doing anything with this output text verbatim, which would be different to just output text. So next, we're going to add some server logic. So again, we're just building on what we've seen before. And again, before we jump into VS Code, you know, this top half of the screen looks familiar. But you can now see within the server function, we are going to add some more functionality. So first of all, we're adding our decorators, output, and render text, because that's what this TXT function will do. And this TXT function, when run, is going to return 
an F string. So two times, so N times two is, and then the, the variables. So there's curly brackets, input dot N. So we know an input value called dot N. So this variable name can be anything. It has to be unique and different for every different variable. You couldn't have six different variables that you wanted to call N behind the scenes because it wouldn't know which one uh, is, is uh, to update. And it's actually going to call it as a function. So for 94, it's going to have 94 times 2, which is 188. And it will show you that there. Um, and as I mentioned, because we've got verbatim here, it's literally created this gray box and it's put it, you know, um, courier or free mono font. If we got rid of this verbatim and just had output text, it would have a white background and it'd be stylized. So it would be the same style as this N up at the top. And you can see it's capital N because I've changed it, the value there. Um, and just uh, if you're paying attention now, it'll help you with the exercise about this uh, output text. And just to jump into example four. And so one of the great things about VS Code with the file explorer on the left, it's so easy to jump between the different files. So again, here, exactly as we saw before, um, if we execute this now, we can now see we've got our header of N, uh, what no one really knows. Control S to save that. You can see uh, it's probably uh, easier to follow along now. Um, and then as we move our slider, we can then see the text below has changed. So whatever we change this to, release it, it will then update the output uh, that's outputted to the screen. As you can see here, um, we it's not stylized, whereas if I added verbatim and save that, you can see the output string is now put in the gray box. Cool. Hopefully this is making sense as we, we, we gradually step up uh, what we're doing with these apps and the, the complexity. Um, and so just to kind of pause for a second and make sure everyone understands how the different parts of the code are interacting with each other. So we've got our UI at the top. We've got our server function below. Remember, they're married together. So when the user moves this slider, this input slider, the value stored as n, lowercase n, is modified. And then that input value is then used in this output string, as you can see here. And that is done through a function called text. Now, I at first found it uh, quite counterintuitive to have a function name within double quote marks. Uh, again, it's just something you'll get used to doing. Uh, and you can see here, that when that value changes, it re-executes its text function or txt function, uh, which will then change that value, which is then what is output, and then is what it's rendered uh, in the screen, so into the output text verbatim. So hopefully you can see value in, modifies something in the server, server does its magic, and then spits out a value, which is then displayed onto the screen. So something else to point out about input controls. Um, uh, input controls are created by calling a Python function, and they take in two arguments, um, and they are, first of all, an ID. Uh, and so an identifier uh, is used to refer to the input's value in the server code. For example, uh, an ID of x1. When we want to call that, we would then call it by saying input.x1, open, close parentheses, within the server function. So hopefully you remember that from uh, the last slide. And the value must be unique across all the input and output objects on that page uh, and should follow Python um, standard variable function naming rules. So lowercase with underscores, uh, alphanumeric characters allowed, but it really shouldn't start with a number. And again, that's just uh, kind of a global rule. And then the second argument is the label. So description of the input that will appear next to it. Um, it can be non if so desired, but hopefully you'll agree it makes a bit more sense as we had before it was N and then I changed it to, to no one really knows. Um, and then you have all the different um, types of inputs options available, input controls available. Uh, for example, you've got input checkbox uh, and then there's additional parameters to say, do you want that checkbox to be ticked or not by default? And again, this link here, and uh, will take you to all of the different input variables uh, available. So a switch, uh, text, 
a slider, a date, a date range, so on and so forth. And if you want more information, let's go to the one we're familiar with, input slider. Again, that tells you, you know, the first two variables, we'll see the ID and the label um, and min, max, and then the, the value to start with. And here's all the other, all the different uh, parameters that you can pass in. And so the documentation is pretty comprehensive as well. So next, um, we'll talk about reactivity. So what we've seen so far and all the examples I've shown you is we change something. And as soon as, for example, we change the slider value, as soon as we let go of the mouse on that new value, it updates the text below. Um, but we can choose to make it so it handles reactivity slightly differently. Let's say there's six different parameters. You may have it so you don't want it to actually update anything until all six parameters are changed. You may only want to change one, and then you might just be able to press a calculate button. Uh, and so again, we've got another example here. We can see we've got an input slider, uh, one through 100, the default value of one. We're going to have an action button, which says the word compute printed on the button, uh, but it's going to have the function name of compute, lowercase. And then it's going to spit out the results, which is this function here. Um, and so what we're doing within this result function we're saying input.compute. So that's taking a dependency on this button. Uh, and then we're doing, we're using a with statement. So with with reactive isolate. Um, and then basically it's going to return a string, uh, taking in the input, the value of n. Now, the difference between this and what you're going to see next is when we first launch the app with this type of um, dot isolate in it will execute automatically. So, you know, the default value is one. So it's going to say result one. Let me just have a look at that. So again, just so you can see here uh, exactly as we had on the slide, we execute it and we can see we have the output value. I change it, nothing is happening. Nothing will happen until I hit compute and then it does it again. But you'll see it by default, it, as soon as we run the app, we ran with whatever the default value was. This is slightly different to if we want a reactivity dot event. So again, the code is very similar here, except this time we're adding a new decorator, reactive dot event, and again, input dot compute. So what's below, excuse me, will not run until the dot compute button is executed or has been pressed, it won't execute that code. So again, if we look in 06 for reactivity slider, um, and I run this, you can see there's no output there. So I can move this all I want. Nothing is going to happen until I hit that compute button. So you may choose to do that, where the default parameters you're providing may not really yield a useful result. Um, or you just want to result, uh, reduce the amount of uh, computational workload um, that the processor or the server is doing. Uh, you may want the user to actually put in the parameters they want and hit the go button or the computer, whatever it is, before the server starts to churn uh, and do what it's doing with those input values. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, the sky's the limit with what you want to do. Um, with creating shiny apps with the, the user interface. So this is just an example here. Uh, and I think there's a link to the code for it. But just to show you how you can build up the complexity, because so far we've just seen kind of one input value, one output, uh, there's a few different things to consider here. So I'm just going to step through uh, the code. And don't worry, I'm not expecting you to, to understand uh, everything that's going on here. But hopefully you'll start to see how it all works. So the first thing just to point out is in this instance, the author has used a page fixed in stage of the page fluid uh, layout. And so first thing is we want, if anyone does know HTML, they know an H3 tag header three uh, of Ermas calculator. We can see that here. And then we've got um, some markdown text and we can see what's typed here just as it works in Markdown, as you'll have seen from my Markdown notebooks in the past, that is what appears here. Next, we can see that we've got a row. So again, thinking horizontally across the page. Within that row, we've then got two distinct columns. Column one, we want to have a width of eight. Um, 
So two thirds of the width of the page, and it's going to have um, different outputs. So these two different user interfaces, uh, UI outputs and a uh, plot as well. And then on the second column, again, the width of four, we can then see it's got um, a panel, um, which is this gray box here. And within that, we've got um, a, the uh, date uh, information and then one for targets, so on and so forth. Um, and so essentially looking at it at a very high level, um, if we use the page fluid instead of the page fixed, we don't need to put the four and the eight to uh, classify or specify the width of the different panels. Um, we've got our panel title. We can then put a, a sidebar within that and then a different uh, sub sidebar and then the main part of the panel as well. So hopefully you, you can see that the hierarchy there. And if you want to have a look at how this would work, we've got an example in 07. Again, just remembering to close the windows I'm not using. I'm not excuse that. We can see here, um, because we as I say page fluid, we're not having to specify the width of the different columns. We've got our panel title. So it's simulate a normal distribution. So this is the entire width here. We've then got a side bar. So this first side bar, then within it has a panel side bar, which is this gray box. And that has three, sorry, four elements inside of that. The input side for the sample size, one for the, uh, and then two text boxes for the mean, and then another slider, number of bins, as you can see, because they are all indented, sorry, uh, to the right, they will all be in that one panel sidebar. Then we've got our main panel, which is where we're then putting our plot, and that's what appears on the right-hand side there. And again, um, the server function that creates the plot is defined below. But again, this is just something it, it, just to um, have a play with yourselves, because obviously there's lots of different reasons why people may want to use Shiny. It could be to render maps. It could be to create these graphs. Uh, it could be, as you'll see in the exercise, because you actually want it to spit out a different file. Um, quite hard to cover all that in it's such a short session, but hopefully you've just got a bit of an idea and you can start having a play with the framework. Uh, and that's what I found when I was learning this from scratch. Just start having a play, look at the examples you provided with and start copying and pasting and manipulating those. Um, and then something else I just wanted to show you, um, not necessarily related to Shani uh, or not specific to Shani in any way, shape or form, um, but it's just the ability to uh, import other functions. So obviously when you install libraries, uh, for example, if you import pandas as PD, you can then do pd.readcsv and that function, which is then imported, well, then, in, you know, you're just putting in a string, which is the location of a CSV file. And then that does lots of things behind the scenes to then actually load the data. But let's say you've created a function and uh, something that you're going to use in your project or in your everyday work, and it, it's not going to change. It, you know, it's pretty static. Uh, rather than having to copy and paste that, you know, def, you know, Bob's function, da, 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 into each and every different project, you can actually save it somewhere. And then you can import it just like you'd import pandas. Um, and what I'm going to do is show you how to work here. Um, apologies, this one will only work locally um, because you can't import uh, custom functions into the web GUI. Uh, so apologies for anyone um, who's following along there. But if we just have a look at the folder 08 by shiny import function, um, I'll close everything else down to avoid confusion, just because there's a few other things I just want to show you in this. So in this folder, PyShiny um, app import custom function, you'll see, as well as the app.py file, there is also another folder called report underscore tools. I created that subfolder. Within that subfolder, there's two files. There is a, uh, a dunder, double underscore in, in it, double underscore dot py, and another one, funks dot py. Now, it's really important that if you um, are going to use the functionality that I'm describing here that, and you want to import it, you have a file with this init.py. If we have a look inside that, we can see we've just got a comment here. And again, you can recycle this file. 
uh, report source, way to recycle, use for code to import the readability of code to improve the readability of code. And again, double underscore version. And I, you can put whatever values you want in here. It just has to have something populated. And then we've got our functs.py. Uh, and in order to get these two functions I've created here, I am relying on two um, libraries being imported, being numpy and matplotlib. And we've got this function called chart, which takes in uh, a single variable, uh, which is um, a number. Uh, and then basically that's going to plot a histogram. And then we've got another one that just says print hello. And then it's just got a string uh, with a variable in it. But if we then look at this app.py file, we have got our standard import, shiny import app render UI. And then we've also got this report tools, which is the name of the folder I created. And then we want to import funks, which was the name of the .py file. And then I'm going to give it an alias, so as RT. So if we have a look down, where are we using RT? Well, we can see here in um, the text function, we're going to return rt.printhello, which you'll remember, print hello is the name of the function. And I'm putting the preceding .rt because it's coming from the report tools funks, which was the alias. And then we've also got for this histogram, I just want it to pull in the chart function. And again, you passing in the variable input and the n. So again, this is the chart function. So when I run this now, we can see that we've got our input slider um, and then we can see the variable name changes um, the string here. And then we've got our really informative histogram, which again changes. So rather than having to have all of these functions defined in this body of text. If it's something you've used before, something you're going to use routinely lots and lots of times, uh, this is another way that you can, as I say, improve the readability of your code and actually store it external to the main um, Python file. Again, not specific to Shiny by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, this is just something more generally uh, I learned about and I thought it could be useful to everyone to have a go of. Again, worth having a little play around with this um, in on your own, just to make sure you, you fully understand how it all hangs together. Cool. Um, and then, because I remembered how excited I got about Folium, uh, and I hope people are the same, you'll remember the five locations from down in Cornwall that we talked about, uh, Bodman, um, saying, I don't know, Dan, help me out. <laughs> um, but essentially, I've used those same points to create a map. And again, just to show you how easy it is to create a map uh, with Shiny, if we're going to open folder 09 and just oops, run this app.py, you can see there's a few more um, imports required for this now. Uh, we've got, because we're using an interactive map, we've got the uh ipy leaflets and we're uh, giving that the alias of l we've got html tools importing that a css again the standard shiny imports as well as shiny widgets and then also pandas as pd again don't get too caught up on this um you know the great thing is you can recycle the code uh, and hopefully uh, what you see here is quite useful and um, it also follows a lot of the same conventions as folium does so um, you'll see that in a second. But essentially with our uh, UI, our user interface, again, we're using the page fluid, and um, we're going to have a divider section that, that's going to have an input slider, uh, and that's going to store the variable of zoom as the value, and that's going to be the map zoom level. We're going to give it a default value of 8, and that's going to run from a value of 1 to 18 on the slider. We've then got um, an output UI, and that's going to be map bounds, which is the name of a function down below. And we're uh, styling it as a cascading style sheet, CSS. Uh, and again, don't get too caught up on these. It's just a case of having a play around uh, and seeing uh, what changing them will do for you. And then we're going to output this widget, which is the map marker. Um, and so what we're going to do here is in our server function, we are going to initialize a map, which we want to display as soon as we run the code. Uh, that will be centered at uh, this lat and long and the zoom value of eight and it's just saying hey we're going to allow the the map to zoom in and out with our scrolly wheel we've got our clinic so bodman um rcht so on and so forth um, i'm going to put the string as a postcode to identify them 
and then the lats and longs. Um, and then turning those this list of lists into a data frame uh, with the clinic postcode coordinates. Um, and then you're going to create markers. Uh, the markers are going to be a white star on a green background. And then for each row in this data frame clinics, I'm going to add these markers onto the pay, onto the map. Again, very, very similar functionality to Folium. Um, I want to add a distance scale. So we're adding this control. And then I want to make a reactive effect. So if we change the zoom, then we want it to re-render the map with that new zoom level. Um, and um, sorry. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, uh, which is obviously that will change if we're using the slider that we've created at the top, as opposed to if we are using the scroll wheel to zoom on the map. Um, and then we've got our app plus our render UI, our map bounds. Uh, and again, it's using a lot of the variables we've created above. So when we execute this now, and again, this is probably just something, you know, to have a play around with in, in your own time. Uh, you know, we can use our, I'm using my mouse wheel here. I can click on the points. Again, I think if you do it in the web version, it will be slightly different output uh, in that you can click on it. So if I paste that into there and hit play, just takes a second because it's importing these other um, libraries. And if I click on that, no, apologies. Oh, there, hovering over it is where you get the labels that um, were saved. Um, and by changing, if I drag and drop the center of the map, we can see the latitude and longitude uh, string uh, updates accordingly as we move that around. And then similarly, we can use the um, map level zoom slider. Once we've changed it, let go of it, it will change the intensity or the level of the zoom in there. So again, um, the, a lot of this code you can recycle. Uh, and as I say, a lot of the functionality is very, very similar to Folium. So if you created a map in Folium, uh, you know, centering it, adding markers, you can also add layers in a very, very similar format as well. Um, it's, um, you know, very easy to translate to get that. So you can spit it out in this format. So that is it for the, the code I wanted to show you. Again, we are on a fairly limited uh, time frame, uh, hence that bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, but with the exercise, uh, as I said, uh, I quite liked it because I thought it's probably the thing that I would use uh, in reality the most. Um, with this code, and I'll just open it, essentially there are five locations where I've replaced a value with four Xs, and then I'll show you where I've uh, identified that to make it easier for you. As I say, um, works best in the web environment, and that's simply because you can then upload a file um, as well as download it, whereas if you do it in VS Code, you'll only be able to upload it. But just to show you what that looks like, in the exercise folder, um, we've got the app exercise. You'll also notice in that folder, there's an import underscore data CSV. Um, and essentially, um, once you've run this code, once you've completed the missing values, you'll execute it. Uh, you'll have a file location um, that you're able to click on. It'll then open the file explorer. You can import this import, doc, uh, import data. Um, it will then render the first so many rows. It's then going to add a new column to that data frame, and then it's going to spit out the output, uh, which includes the new column that you've put in. Um, and again, if any missing values are um, used, of which there are five that you need to complete, you just have identified them by adding this comment to the left. So up to people what they want to do. I'm happy to stay on the line if people want to have uh, go into the breakout rooms and work through this now. Similarly, I also appreciate that um, we've only got nine minutes of a lot of time left. So I'm happy to open up to any questions uh, and maybe hear from people if they've got any um, ideas or um, thoughts about how they may be able to use Shiny for their project or something else they're doing in their daily work. Let me know what everyone thinks. Yep, I uh, see a question. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, quick question. I really 
if we step back at the very beginning, I, I don't understand how in the web browser, I yeah. create a blank page where I can put my code. Because if we go in the examples, like the page where you are now, yeah, I cannot share this. Otherwise, people, you know, users will see the code. Uh, how do you do it, like in the examples in the slides yeah. for the respiratory diseases? Excellent question. I forgot some of my other slides. Um, so there's different ways that you can deploy your Shiny apps uh, once they are done. So if you wanted to share them with other people within the organization, um, obviously, this is kind of more like once they're done. So if it was just a show and tell, um, the easiest option could be what we've just showed you or share your screen with, um, you know, VS Code or what it happens to be. Um, but you can deploy on uh, shinyapp.io. So this is cloud hosting. They've actually put their prices up a bit because I, I looked when I first started doing this and then checked again and the prices had jumped up. Uh, so, you know, the one they recommend is this, this basic level, but that's 440 US dollars a year. Um, the value of that is you can import your code onto a Shiny server and then it's all taken care of in the cloud. You just give a, a URL uh, that your organization can use to access it. If you want, if your IT department's happy to give you a Shiny server locally, uh, this is an open source software, so you can have it running within um, your um, local area uh, on the network. And so it'll just be an IP address that people can navigate to, uh, similar to what we saw before, but it's open to anyone within the organization. Um, there is uh, Posit Connect. And again, this will be a chargeable exercise because again, uh, our studio, uh, they are up for making money by hosting the um, code for you. Um, and then if you do want any more information on any of these, uh, the documentation is available just to talk about how you can um, deploy the apps accordingly, whether it be a cloud or hosted service or something that you would run uh, locally within your own uh, uh, IT infrastructure. Just to interject there as well, um, Elliot, I'll just, just to flag off, I think for most, so I think most um, HSMA projects, and this applies to both um, Shiny and uh, Streamlit, Streamlit has a kind of free tier, which allows you to, I think it's, this has changed, I think that allows you two simultaneous users, I think so it's slightly less generous than Shiny. Um, but to be honest, most of the stuff that you're going to be developing for your HSMA projects, you're probably not going to um need lots and lots of people uh you know you're not most of you aren't probably going to be developing a you know a big app that is going to be used by everyone in the trust at the same time that that's probably not what you're going to be doing for your hsma projects um uh, you're probably going to have something that people will want to you know sort of access every now and then um so probably for most of you for your hsma projects the free tier would be enough but i think if you get into you know you might in developing something for your project you might end up you know going on to develop something a bit more uh, advanced and then it's nice that you've got the the hosting options um there or as elliot said you could uh, ask your it um it department to host it within your organization um, and that's an option too thanks dan and yeah i've just opened up the the current page so yeah as dan mentioned um you do get a free tier here so i can have five different applications and then 25 active hours um, so these are just hours when your application is in use, i.e. not idle, uh, and then capped at 25 per month, which I'd imagine that, you know, would, would be some heavy going um, to, to kind of max that out, uh, depending on what you're doing. Uh, hope, you know, most interactions could just be a few minutes uh, for each different user. So hopefully that is helpful as well. Thank you. Any other um, questions at all? The only other thing, um, just while anyone's having a think, um, that I just wanted to point out, what are the differences with Streamlit? So you can really impress Tom when he gives his talk on the, I think, the 4th of July, 6th, 4th, anyway. Um, so Streamlit does not require you to organize your code in the same rigid manner, uh, the app UI server, so on and so forth. Um, it will, as I mentioned earlier, it will rerun the entire app each time there's a user interaction, whether it be a click or a change of parameter uh, or moving a slider. Uh, and, you know, this is one of the advantages that the CTO um, of Posit mentioned. Uh, it's less computationally expensive when running uh, Shiny apps. Um, and, but, um, well, I should say with that, um, you know, it, the above makes it very easy um, to create an app with Streamlets. But I think if you need to get more complex, 
and stream that kind of would have its own limitations whereas because you've got such a rigid framework um with shiny that it makes it easier to to grow it and grow and grow it uh, the other advantage i see or one description that i heard which i quite like is having used um streamlet myself you do all your code for what you want to do whether it be you know you're phoning your maps you this you that the other and then you kind of sprinkle the streamlet magic on it so you you know you structure however you want and you add streamlet code in intersperse it compared to shiny whereas have you seen it has to be quite a rigid structure to use so from that point of view possibly streamlet could be easier uh, to implement um whereas you know to implement retrospectively to a project whereas something like shiny you probably need to start from ground zero with your your eye on it's going to be a shiny app and that's how you're going to have to structure things so that's just something else to bear in mind as well if anyone's thinking they may be using um you know a, a, a gui tool so stream or shiny uh try and think about it as early as possible um just so it's uh you know if you are going to go with something more complex you're not going to have to suddenly rewrite your like all your code at the last minute and um, that's my only piece of advice there I think to summarize Elliot, I, I, I mean, I've not personally used Streamlit, um, but uh, having seen bits of it and uh, having seen the the shiny stuff today, I think I think it would probably be fair to say that Streamlit, you'll get very, very powerful uh, looking stuff for relatively simple applications um, very, very easily. Um, so it will be a lot simpler than what you've seen today. Um, but as Elliot said, if you, I think probably if you, the power of Shiny would be if you really want to go all in um, on uh, some, you know, developing a bit more sophisticated um, uh, web apps, then I think uh, Shiny will give you a lot more flexibility for that kind of thing. Because um, I think Streamlit apps, they've got a look to them, haven't they? That they are very similar looking um, because they're quick and dirty. That you you can you can knock something off incredibly quickly. And when you see um, those of you coming to the uh um tom's session on the 4th of july you'll see how incredibly easy it is so he'll he will walk you through um it, putting a, a a streamlit interface on a discrete event simulation and it is incredibly easy um so it's really easy to do that um but uh i think uh, elliot raises a good point that there are if you were going to really go in uh, with deeper stuff you might then uh want a bit more flexibility um uh to create something it may not be it depends what you want to do um, I think, you know, for most of your HSMA projects, the likelihood is you're going to want a web interface to, uh, in order to allow people to run the model with different parameters and get some nice graphs out. Streamlit will probably do that sufficiently, but you might, depending on what you want to do, if you're, you know, particularly if you've got a more sort of geographic project, for example, you might want to think about actually focusing a bit more on the web uh app aspect and in which case you might then choose to look at something like shiny which is a bit more advanced um, and will give you a bit more a bit more flexibility so so one's quick and easy so if you found shiny too complex complex today don't be put off web apps um because stream that's really really easy honestly <laughs> um but uh i think it's worth looking into shiny if you are interested in in exploring that a bit further i think yeah i definitely completely agree with Dan. Um, you know there was someone who had done a, a a great project um and you know we gave the suggestion of oh, why don't you turn it into a web app and with, without knowing about it oh god i to make, turn it into a web app at the 11th hour seems like too much work but with streamlit it's very 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 achievable uh, it is a lot more straightforward so yeah i agree there alex do you have a question No. Uh, yes, sir. Do you have a question? Uh, I do actually. Yeah. Um, do we know if there's any difference in functionality between Python, Shiny, and R Shiny? And that can, is there anything you can do in R that you can't do in Python? Um, I can't to be honest. I, I've never used R Shiny, uh, so I'm not an aficionado. But in the um, in the slides, there is a link, uh, and that has a bit of a um, crash course on the difference between the two. Um, just to help you um, get up and running. Um, I think obviously you've got um, the Python version is much newer. Only came out uh, November last year. Oh, sorry, slightly earlier, but um, it you know it's 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 a lot newer, so probably won't have had as much time and community involvement uh, as the other. So you, you know you may find limitations 
um, in certain things. But, you know, as I say, everything we've been able to look at today, you know, drawing maps, manipulating data, printing, uh, most of the stuff that you probably want to use it for um, seems to work pretty well. Yeah, and just uh, one last point on the slide there. Previously, it said Streamlit with the reactivity, it reruns the whole thing. Um, I think I remember like a month or two ago and seeing there's a cache decorator in Streamlit, which cache is the output of a function. So it only runs if something changes. But yeah. I don't know if that's the same thing. Um, that, well. To be honest, that um, could absolutely um, be the case. I think out of the box, um, it will try and run everything. Um, but again, they may have made an improvement to the functionality um, to try and re reduce server load and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, it could well be. Cheers. Thank you. No problem. I just felt I'll pop this in the chat. Uh, yes, I, I just. As you said that, I just Googled that to see, it looks like there is something new. Um, so it may be worth uh, checking out that. I've literally read the first sentence, uh, but it sounds <laughs> like what we're talking about. Um, so yeah, maybe worth checking that out because that is a limitation of Streamlit. It won't be, you know, if you're, most of the models you will build for HSMA, it's not, a, you're talking milliseconds difference. Um, but if you wanted to go on and build something a bit more complex, then it might be a bit of a pain if everything is refreshing all of the time, every time you change something. So um, yeah, uh, it might be worth checking that out because that, 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 uh, that, that is a limitation of Streamlit, definitely. Great. Um, so unless there's any other questions, uh, we're more or less on time. Um, apologies for the uh, the speed I went through this. I think I was a bit over-optimistic thinking it could be done in 90 minutes. Uh, but like I say, um, if anyone's got any questions about the exercise, um, certainly please get in touch with me. Um, you know, uh, you know, learning this from zero, uh, I kind of did what I would advise uh, or not advise people to do rather than going through all the examples and starting to walk before you can run, I definitely decided to jump in at the deep end uh, and then read the documentation afterwards. And it makes so much more sense once you've read the documentation. So um, <laughs> there's a lesson uh, in life to share with everyone there. But as I say, more than happy to share any knowledge um, I've learned about this. So if anyone's got specific use cases they want to take offline, then um, it'd be great to hear from you. Lovely. So um, as I say, this is my last live session. So thank you all very much for your participation uh, and patience with me over the last, um, when did we start? September, October. Um, it's been great getting to know all of you uh, and I wish you all the best of success for those who are in project teams, obviously with those, uh, but also for everyone else. Uh, hopefully um, you have developed a very soft spot for Python and you wanna continue learning uh, and hopefully implementing it in your, your daily work. Uh, to you know, create efficiency uh, and derive more value from the department you're working in, or, or even your uh, your personal life um, with it, with all the things that you can do and the potential you can reach there. Um, and so, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, the solutions will be up later today or first thing tomorrow. Uh, but obviously, um, please do get in touch if anyone's got any questions. Thanks, everyone, and uh, take care. Bye now. <laughs>